Can you share again or? Yes, please. I think maybe we can. No, share. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so to have quite a long program here. So we are uh, now to look into how does one set up the model. Now we know how to describe the structure so that these uh, uh, invariances are contained. Uh, how do we describe the model? And then in a minute, how do we collect the data? So more than a minute. So uh, first of all, uh, we'll be using the um, uh, the Gaussian, Gaussian process regression, and I just throw you these uh, throw these equations at you. I'll explain them in a in a minute. But this is all it is. I mean, if X is describing your um, uh, uh, your structure, then basically you want to set up uh, some kernel elements. They are called that uh, arrive from asking the question: How far apart are your structures? And uh, you use them in two ways. There's both a matrix and a vector. And then you can make your prediction based on this uh, matrix uh, vector uh, calculation. That's all it is. But let me go slowly about it. So X, that's the descriptor. We know all about descriptors now. And we have seen that histograms are the best ones. And uh, I've now um, looked uh, broader at this carbon six cluster. So rather than just uh, considering this one here that I had before, I have now prepared a whole data set of seven structures with corresponding energies. And uh, then my claim is that I can use this, what is called the kernel, uh, to build the model upon. And, and again, look into it. It's, it's the distance between two vectors th that are the descriptors for the given systems. Then it's the they are uh, uh, scaled according to some parameter lambda. They are put into this exponential, meaning that if uh, if the if the exponential gets a zero, it will output a one. So something where there's no distance between two structures gives you one for this exponential. And then since it's multiplied with theta naught, which is a parameter, it gives you theta naught. So why not uh, choose for theta naught 100? If we do that, we can interpret the kernel elements in percent. And we can say if a kernel element between, between two structures is 100, it means that they are 100% the same. And if it's less than 100, they are, well, dissimilar to some extent. And uh, let's, uh, let's look at it. I now assume that in my search efforts, I have found those four structures that I highlight. And, uh, and then I start evaluating all the kernel elements uh, that they have together. So for instance, uh, structure number three here with itself, of course, is uh, having a kernel element of 100%. If you ask the question, how similar is this structure to the one next to it here? Then with, with the parameter 50 for lambda, it has a 85% uh, similarity. What does that mean? It means that when, the, when this piece of math compares those two histograms, it comes up with 85. And you can, you can go on and, and see then how similar is it to this histogram over here? Well, uh, that's a similarity of 90, and then let, let's find something that makes sense. The last two, for instance, they are, they are dissimilar. It's, they are not similar by 100%. They're slightly dissimilar, but they are actually 94% similar with this metric. And that makes sense. If you look at the two structures, out of, out of this bunch of structures, these are the ones that resemble each other the most to our human eye. If you look at these two structures, they are sort of, uh, uh, pointing in, in, in three directions, each of them, one has a longer arm than the other, but that's all. We humans would consider them the more alike structures in, in this bunch. And, uh, and this metric, this kernel matrix uh, element also does so. Fine, that's, that's exactly what we need. So, so now we have that uh, metric, 
And uh, as I have found the structures and they are now to serve as my data set, I of course also know their DFT energies. And these are actually uh, DFT energies that, that, that I did evaluate. And then all I, I want to do now is to, to solve a, a set of linear equations that relate uh, the, the structures to each other in this way. So, so meaning that if, if I have a, uh, this row of kernel elements and multiply onto these unknown parameters alpha, then I should get the energy of the first structure. So these, the first row of kernel elements, they all relate to, the, to this first structure up here. It's actually number three in this, in this enumeration that I have here. And, and, and the same thing applies to the next row. So they, that's all concerned with structure four, this one. And when you multiply on to these unknowns, uh, unknown alphas, you get energy four. Okay, this is what I want. And, and it can be written in the short form like this. And it's very, very simple to solve. You just have to find the, uh, the inverse of this kernel matrix, multiply on both sides of the equation, and then you get the alphas. And the only problem is that you cannot always find the inverse of a matrix. Uh, if some of your structures are too alike and so on, it, then it's maybe ill-conditioned, uh, this problem. So what you do to make sure that you can always find it is you add a little bit to the diagonal of the kernel uh, matrix, and uh, that is referred to as a noise. So you, uh, you say, it's okay that you find alpha parameters for me that are not the exact ones, um, but that you sort of, that, that when the model acts, it, it won't reproduce the original data completely because the data could be a little noisy. And that is, that is what is contained here. It's a very ad hoc uh, approach I have. It's not a mathematician's approach uh, to, to what, what is in this. Um, but I do that, and then I get these uh, alphas, and they make no sense at all. But we remember what they were good for. They were good for multiplying onto the kernel matrix, and uh, and then when you do that, you get uh, the energies back. That was what solving the the, the linear uh, equations uh, was uh, meant for. That was that you should find these alphas so that when you when you multiply them onto your matrix, you will get the, the original energies. And I put them here next to each other, and you can see with whatever amount of noise I added here, I reproduce nicely the original data. So I've converted these uh, uh, th th this this amount of data here into some parameters, and the parameters can now be used for making predictions. Um, and, and that is illustrated here. So now I take a new structure and I, and I pretend I don't know the total energy of that yet, the DFT energy. I don't know that yet, but I can calculate what is the kernel uh, matrix element between this structure, this histogram here, and each of those in my model. So I get four numbers, and you can see here, uh, number two is the, is the largest number, 96. So what, the, what, what this kernel element tells me is that the new structure I, I, I'm considering looks the most like the second of those I already had, namely this one. And that again conforms with, with what we would say from uh, eyeballing it. Good. And then how do I get the prediction? Well, all I have to do is to make this multiplication, multiplication of the kernel uh, vector for that new structure onto the um, parameters I just derived, and then I get a prediction. And you can see it's 40.1, which is not too far away from uh, the 39.6 uh, I had over here, which is the real value. But that's that's a prediction I cannot expect to, to hit exactly. And you can see if I take the, some of the other structures and I've deliberately uh, based my model on the less stable ones, and now I'm now trying to identify the uh, the most stable ones as being more stable. That's a that's a hard job, but I'm trying. And you can see it's uh, it's not it's not capturing the that this one is the most stable, but it's doing a decent job on the other two. And then I've added a small uncertainty here, and that is. Um, 
the, uh, uh, that is coming out of this expression that I had down here, and I will have not have time to sort of go into where does that come from, but basically it, it means that when I have this data up here, I can produce a number of models that are, uh, um, that are all equally likely uh, based on that data. And when I then make the prediction on this variety of models, then I'll get a, I'll get a distribution in the um, predictions. And that distribution will be broad for the first structure and will be more narrow for the next two according to this formula down here. I, I, I will not be able to explain it in, in any better way. But um, uh, yeah. We can, uh, we can carry this uncertainty with us whenever we use a Gaussian process regression model uh, and, and do it in this way that whenever we plot uh, the, um, the prediction, and in this case, it's the green curve over here, which is a prediction, we plot, and does it show? Yes, we also plot the a shaded region around it, which is uh, where we would also expect uh, we could have had the prediction if the model had been slightly different. And, uh, and here, the, the case is, uh, is uh, slightly different from my, what I had on the previous slides. This time I'm saying, let me only know that one structure that I've highlighted with a red box. Let me only know that. And then let me uh, see what I will predict in terms of energy for structures that are either uh, compressed, that is when I go to the left, or expanded, that's when I go to the right. Or uh, if we go one row up here, these structures, they are also compressed and expanded, but they have a different geometry. But I, I base my model only on this one single data point. It's a very poor model. It has nothing to learn from almost. But at least you can see that as you move away from this one data point, it's, it says, okay, I expect the energy to go up because the further I go out here on this to the right, the more different does the histogram look. And, and also if I go to the left, it also looks different from my data point. So I would also expect the energy to uh, go up. It only goes up very slightly here. Uh, uh, and that has to do with how the bins are in, in this histogram. And, uh, and you can see it does the same thing up here for the, uh, for the other geometry. It has never seen this geometry. So it doesn't, it doesn't uh, make presumably a very good prediction for the energy of, of, uh, of this structure, but it gets the slope. It, it can say, okay, uh, the thing that happens uh, as you go away from, from somewhere like here is that your histogram changes and you're presumably not so similar to the data point any longer. So the energy goes up. That, that is what is over here. And the blue line, that's the true result. And you can see down here, we are pinning the model at the, uh, at the true result where we have given the data. And uh, now I give it some more data. So I pin it more. And, uh, and you can see if I go back and forth, you can see the I get some shape now in the in the in the lower uh, the diagram here where where now it really understands quite a bit of the energy landscape for this structure where it has three data points, but it actually at the same time also understands more about the energy of the other structure, and this is this is the 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 model being able to identify what is the equilibrium bundling of a molecule. It can identify that. Uh, or what is the equilibrium bond length between atoms, it can identify that in one molecule and then apply it uh, to another molecule or cluster or whatever these are. And then of course, once you start getting data points up there, you can also pin that and, and become more accurate. Um, yeah, I have a hands-on exercise and I, I don't know uh, how you feel about it. Um, if should I keep going, or will, perhaps I give you a few minutes for you to to try this out yourself. You have to, in order to get started, you have to write <coughs> your own kernel. 
So go back into the, I can also do it here, but I, I won't I won't solve it right away because then I, I, I fear you will miss some of the points. So go back into this. And then when you when the cell doesn't work, it's because you have to write the kernel. And I can go back and show you. No, the kernel is actually written in there, so, so no problem. Then I'll just run around in the room for one second and. Uh, it's yeah. the same notebook. Right? Yeah, it's the same notebook. Yeah. Yeah. Try it out yourselves. If you have questions, ask. Uh, yeah, or you know, at the at the very back, he's raising. Already hands. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, not recording So we have to move on the whole kernel with the constant of 100. Okay. So I I think I'll I'll fill out mine because otherwise I cannot get to the lower. <laughs> Uh, once myself, uh, the next exercises. So let's see. We're back here. <coughs> First GPR model. Yeah. So basically, I, it does a lot to read here, I realized. So basically, here it's implementing this uh, kernel expression, and then with, with that uh, theta. Uh, uh, the magnitude outside and um, that has that has actually escaped from this expression. I'm sorry about that. So so we would say np dot exponential minus d, which has been evaluated on the on the line before, uh, divided by two divided by ls squared. So if I do that, 
Um, I should be able to now take the reaction coordinate uh, descriptor, which is not the, the best one we know, uh, but let's see what it says. It says then that well, I have three data points, one just off the, the start, one halfway through and one 80% through the pathway. And it says that the first two, they agree with, uh, with 60% and then the one much further away only with 28%. And then I could go back and change the the, um, the length scale, for instance, and, and say, what if it's a very short length scale? Let's see what that gives. Um, let me go all the way down here. Then we can see, <laughs> okay, I, 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 I took a, a, a too short length scale. Now we have 100% agreement for the first one with itself, and we have 10 to the 19, uh, overlap with the next one because we have made an, a kernel that is so narrow that it, it sees no uh, um, overlap between neighboring uh, uh, data points in this limited data set. And you, I mean, I think I think we don't have time during the lecture here to go into this, but those of you who, who like this notebook, you can now play around with, with these parameters. You can also play around with the noise, for instance, and um, and, and see what that matters. I'll, I'm not sure if I need this later on, so I'll just reestablish that it's a, it's a decent length scale like that. Okay. Uh, and then comes, um, here we, uh, we solve the model and we get these alphas that we have no idea what to use for. And, uh, and then comes uh, the, uh, uh, here I asked you to write uh, the code that will make the prediction uh, for the known uh, structures. So, so that's just to sort of the, the, the sanity check, the one I, I did here in the, uh, in the slides, uh, this, uh, where was it? This sanity check here where, where I said, okay, I had these data points that ended at these energies, and now with the model, I would predict these energies. That is the same kind of thing we should do here. And, um, and one can sort of be inspired by uh, where can we see that? I think there was one place one could see it. Uh, down here, down here. Okay, it's a little cheating. So um, I look further down in the uh, in the code. We can, we can see when I make it for one vector, it looks like this. It's the it's the vector transposed times the alphas plus the prior. So let me do that up here. So I take the entire uh, 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 kernel matrix transpose it, multiply it with my alphas and add the prior. And um, if I do that, I get these uh, predicted numbers. And if I just print out Y, that's the, the, um, uh, the data I tried to fit, you can see it's bang on. And of course it's bang on because I, I have three degrees of freedom, uh, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and I have very limited, um, I, have very, I have very diverse data. Uh, so I can more or less use one alpha for each. Um, there's, there, there's nothing to confuse the model. Um, you, could, you could go back and then you could say, okay, let me crank up the noise so that the, uh, when we diagonalize the matrix or invert the matrix, we don't do it. Um, we don't do it uh, accurately. Now I put 10 as the noise, and then I can go about again doing the alphas. I can do the, uh, the evaluation of the uh, prediction, and then it, uh, I can do the evaluation of, of what would this model now predict for the known data points. And then it will predict more or less the same number for all of them. It, now it says, if you are dealing with so much noise, I will not discriminate between those uh, three pieces of data you are giving me. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. So let, let me uh, go back here. Now I get new alphas with a small noise again. So, so for you who didn't see it, so, so right now it says prediction is 9.69 for all three. And then I hit return here. And now it's 9.73 and 9.61 and so on. And that looks much more like the, uh, 
uh, the real thing. So now you have in this notebook a small Gaussian process regression model that actually operates on real uh, atoms. And uh, the question is, and you can uh, let, let's let's go further down. I think we can go. The, the the question now is yeah that's why if you should if you have filled in the same thing as I did you should be able to get this plot. The question is now how well does this model predict energies for uh, neighboring or for uh, for, uh, for for structures that lie in between those three data points. So remember, we, we picked our data points at, at almost 0, 0.5, and 0.8. And, uh, and this model says, I would assume that it's a smooth curve that goes through those three data points. And if we chose different parameters, the, the kernel width, that was this lambda in the denominator in the exponential, um, we could um, we could get the model to predict completely different things. Then then this curve would look different. The the now we come with some test data, and um, uh, uh, well, well that's already what is done here. So the test data that's the green curve. So so the green curve connects some real data points that uh, work for which we know what the energy is. And, uh, and we can see the blue curve that makes the prediction is not able to sort of capture all of that. It just makes this uh, smooth uh, prediction. Let's uh, inspect uh, uh, the uh, uncertainty and see uh, if it at least is, is aware that it doesn't make very good predictions. And, uh, and that's the next cell you should also be able to run. And here you see that, yes, uh, whenever you're far away from your data points, uh, the model becomes uh, uh, um, uncertain. And, and, uh, and actually now our test data, the green curve, doesn't look so uh, crazy because that's fair enough. I mean, you, you have made a model based on very few data points. So it's fair enough that you are quite uncertain uh, uh, in those readings and, and it, it, it fits nicely here. Um, I think the next thing is we will, yeah, we will, um, now we will do something different from these, these three data points, they already span the entire range of uh, the pathway, or almost the entire range from, from zero to 0.8. Uh, let's make, and that's what happens in the next cells, let's make some data that only spans the very first part of it, the, the left-hand side uh, up to 8% of the pathway. And if we plot that, I think that's happening here. I hope it also runs on your uh, machines. Then you can see now the, the training data that we use to, to sort of fix our model lies over here in the left-hand side. And then the prediction becomes this. I mean, the model learns that Oh yeah, you're giving me uh, four or five points that uh, move to the right and increase in energy. My expectation is that that will keep on going. When we know that's not true. We have just seen the green curve. We, we know that that's not true. The green curve up here said that the energy is more or less just fluctuating up and down over some uh, over this range. So this is not very good. And why is that happening? Well, that's happening because of our our descriptor is this descriptor that just says how far have I come along the pathway? And we know that's not a very good descriptor. So we have to increase uh, um, the complexity of the descriptor. And that's what the next cells are about. So only thing is we need to, uh, you need to go in and write a dis uh, another descriptor here. And I would like you to write the Cartesian coordinate descriptor. So if you go back, you can see here we we up here we make the model. Um, make model comes here. These are these are all um, ACOX function uh, calls or ACOX uh, uh, class instances. So so for instance here the descriptor here we provide to the make model that gives us a model. That descriptor we have declared further up, and and I had to look for it. Uh, let's see, it was must have been a while ago. There, there. 
So here we de declared it as the reaction coordinate descriptor. And, and then this modularity of AGOX enables you to choose another descriptor. And in, in, the, in the last lesson, <laughs> an hour ago, we had three other descriptors. So we can go back and see what they, what they were. So we had one here, the nearest distance descriptor that we in, uh, instantiated like that. And we had another one up here, the Cartesian coordinate descriptor that we instantiated like that. Ah, so this is the copy paste uh, thing. Copy from that cell and then all the way to the down here to where, I mean, I'm solving the, the, the case, but I'm, I, I'm showing you how I, I navigate this. Uh, so, so that's what I have to do here. Ah, okay. So I do that, instantiate it. Um, okay, it would perhaps be nicer. I don't. I dislike this. I dislike it because now I'm making a new instance. I would rather have the left hand side of the equation up here. Let, let me do that instead. I, I don't know how strong you are in, in Python, but but this this thing I just did would work. But I already have it instantiated here, and it's called CC descriptor. So so that looks nicer to sort of reuse that than to pass it a new in, instance of the class. So uh, I, I hope I didn't lose you there. Um, we go down, put it in here. Hopefully it has worked already on your computers. So this is where I put in my instance of the uh, partition coordinate descriptor. I run it and I display what the prediction now becomes. So remember, as long as I had the, the pathway descriptor, it just kept going up. It couldn't make any sense. Now with the Cartesian coordinates, something happens. It, it says, ah, oh, yeah, but, but they are far out. The coordinates, they start looking a little bit like the ones I started from. So now my prediction will bend over and, uh, and become small again. And uh, we can go on. Uh, now you'll see how it works. So I don't think you have to do it in the next uh, cells here. So we can take that. Uh, at, at some wise nearest neighbor descriptor that you implemented in, in, last, in the last hour, that's called ND descriptor rather than CC descriptor. So otherwise it's the same code. And, uh, and then we run that. And uh, with that, we get a much richer prediction. Now, I mean, at the time we introduced it, and, and the first time Matt Peter, he showed it to me, I said, that's a ridiculous descriptor, will work uh, for nothing. But actually it makes a lot of sense because that, that's the one telling you, is an atom having the, the distance to its neighbors that is similar? Uh, I mean, the, the, how do the distances that atoms experience to neighboring atoms, how do they compare from one structure to the next? That is what that descriptor cares about. And that is what goes into the kernel when you have this distance measure between descriptors. So the, the more like two environments are in two different structures, the, the more uh, similar will those two structures be considered by the kernel. And, and that helps the model making a better uh, prediction. And then finally, we have uh, this uh, fingerprint. And I, I got the question in the, in the uh, break, what is inside the fingerprint? And uh, you can see here, there must be something good inside it because it makes a, a really rich uh, and uh, appealing prediction. It's not completely true, but, but it makes something that looks really nice based on just these four or five data points over here. Um, and what is inside the fingerprint was this histogram of distances. So it contains, I showed you the very rich histogram and, and it's composed of gold, gold distances, gold, nickel distances, nickel, nickel distances, gold, gold, gold angles, gold, gold, nickel angles, gold, nickel, nickel angles, and so on. That's what the fingerprint uh, descriptor is about. And it had 270 of those bars um, but, uh, but this model can make sense out of it based on these five data points and give you this uh, rich prediction. So we'll return to that um, later on. I have the summary here. 
So we saw that it matters a lot what your representation is. Don't rely on this uh, one dimensional representation of telling you where you are on the path. Uh, perhaps Cartesian gives you a little bit more. The uh, nearest neighbor was quite good. And now the uh, fingerprint uh, gets uh, a whole lot. I have just a, a small comment here. Everything I've been presenting so far is about uh, global descriptors. So if I have a structure, I also have only one descriptor for the entire structure. And uh, I have some slides uh, detailing that uh, oftentimes you would not feed your model with the global descriptor that applies to the entire system. You would feed it with descriptors that are local. So you would, you would zoom in on one atom and make the histogram for that and feed that into a machine learned model. And then uh, give that should give the local energy for that, for that one atom. And then the same model can also give the local energy for the other atoms. And then you can sum up all those local energies and get the total energy. And I had some slides about how that looks in a neural network, but I'll, I'll not go through those uh, because of the time. It can be done in neural network and it can also be done for Gaussian process regression, regression. And that's where you need to go to make something that is robust uh, and, uh, and where you don't need too much data. Okay, I will now consider the, the uh, final piece that enters uh, the active learning uh, uh, that is required for this uh, machine learning potential. And that is how do you choose the data points that uh, are the best ones? And I'll return, as I promised, to uh, Meldis GOFI method. And by the way, GOFI stands for Global Optimization of First Principles Energy Expressions. Uh, it's a stupid uh, acronym, but that's what it uh, was. So uh, let's consider that we, at some point, have, I mean, we have an energy landscape that is the true landscape, DFG, very expensive. And we know it at certain points, all the red points. And the blue curve is the true energy landscape, but we don't know it. We only know it at those points. Then we make one of these Gaussian process regression models, the green curve. It goes through all the red points, or almost, depending on that noise uh, uh, level you set. And then we have the uncertainty on the, um, on the model. So meaning that, um, Given that amount of data, you could get models anywhere inside the green shaded area. The mean of all those models that would make sense given, given those data, um, the mean value of all models is the, is the green curve inside the shaded area. Okay. Now in a search context, what you will do is you will generate these Random structures. That's that's what we had in, in, in the very beginning. The, the starting point for all the purple relaxation paths. You would generate some random structures. So they now lie away from the blue curve, which is the true curve. Because we don't have access to their DFT energy. The expensive energy is inaccessible at this time, but we have access to their predicted energy. That's the green curve. So, we, so I put the orange points now on the green curve. These are the, the many simultaneous attempts you are making at finding the, new, the, the, the global minimum. So you, can, you start out with those orange points and, uh, and then you can relax them on your model. But you're actually better off if you relax them on your, uh, um, on your lower confidence bound. And what is that? That is, that is the, the model energy, the eGPR, that's the, the center uh, model here. And then minus a number of times the uncertainty that takes you down the bottom of these uncertainty regions. And now I have relaxed them. So, so they started out at some uh, strange places following my rattling or, or perturbation of the structures. And now they have relaxed down to the bottom of those uh, uncertainty regions. And I can choose the one with the lowest uh, energy minus 
these, this number of uncertainties. I can choose this one and say, that's probably the one that is the best contender for a, uh, a new valuable DFT data point. I mean, I could, I could choose any of them. They, they are all now in uncertain regions because they've been relaxed in this lower confidence bound. So any of them would bring new knowledge to my model, but the, the one over here is the one that, that is most likely to not only bring new knowledge, but also be the global minimum. And that's the idea behind the Gofi method. That is, you, you, you spend your, or you do your relaxation in this uncertainty loving uh, landscape. And, and then you pick the one with the combined uh, lowest energy and highest uncertainty. Uh, and, and, and that is as proven by the, uh, the, this um, uh, measure that we had, the, the, the shift of success curves as proven by that, that's a very strong uh, way, I uh, hear have it, <laughs> a very strong way of, um, uh, of acquiring data and, uh, and solving uh, problems like this. So, so you, you see, my I've been detailing now. How is it I get the next, next data point? Well, I trust the model I have into giving me low energy uh, uh, or bringing me into low energy regions, but I also trust the uncertainty and take me even further into regions uh, that could be promising. And uh, people often ask me, that, but then how do you decide on the value for this kappa, this constant that? Uh, uh, enters the um, uh, the lower confidence bound and guides me. Well, uh, if you if you choose zero, you are basically ignoring the uh, uh, the uncertainty, and you're you're trusting your model uh, fully. If you are choosing a higher number, you're starting to say, okay, I also I also need to uh, bring in this uncertainty. If you're taking a too high value. Uh, you are you, you are sort of neglecting the energy and you are uh, favoring only uncertainty. We'll do that in a minute in the uh, notebook. If you only uh, favor uncertainty and neglect the energy altogether, you will you will keep finding things that are far away from what you have seen before because they are the mo most uncertain. We have seen that with our distance measure uh, with the descriptor. And, and uh, here's the search where you can see it, it really gives you crazy, crazy molecules um, as, as the new structures that are found if you have a high value of kappa. If you, on the other hand, choose zero, or you can even choose negatives, or you can choose to sort of penalize uncertainty, then uh, a model will favor new structures that look almost like the ones you've already seen. And then uh, the, the search, will start producing data that is only minutely changed from, from one episode to the next. So, so basically, Kappa is a handle on uh, how much exploitation to the left here and how much exploration to the right you get. And uh, I mean, we have, we have mapped out these curves for a number of systems and I've seen the, the maximum to lie at about uh, two, uh, perhaps in this plot it's four, but, but, but it's in that range, two to four. So that's the, that's the answer. Kappa should be in that range. Now, um, Ms. Peter went ballistic and uh, made a widget for you <laughs> in the notebook. And, um, and I hope it works. Um, I mean, I know it works if you have been following what I did at the on my screen. So, but, but I, I'm I'm a little uncertain how much is lacking. So, so please raise your hand if you if your widget is not working because then it it will be because uh, you have not, for instance, a, a model defined or something. Uh, if you didn't get this uh, exponential times uh, of exponential of minus d divided by divided by the length scale squared. So I'm I'm paddling here because I don't know when I get to, uh, I'm just executing cells. And I apologize, I, there's a lot to be read and uh, we have no time for doing it, but, um, but the widget, once it works, is really nice. So this one you can close. 
and um, then hopefully this comes up on some screens. Do, do, do you have it, some of you? Yes, great. So basically, you can take your, uh, you, you can inspect. No, that doesn't, that's, yeah, yeah, it, I just have to be more patient. You can inspect structures along this pathway from zero to one by, by moving this uh, uh, bullet here. So, so that will take you, it, there's a little delay here, it seems for me. So that should take me back to the beginning. It has, that's not the beginning, this one. Okay, now I'm back at the beginning. So, so that's what this thing is about. Then you can choose your descriptor. Then you can choose your, uh, the way you, you acquire and then, I just introduced this lower confidence bound. So that is what is in the first widget. You cannot even choose something other than that. In a minute, we'll make one where we only go for the uncertainty and don't include any um, energy. But this one is the energy minus kappa times the uncertainty and kappa is, has a number down here. So you, you can you can try and, and see uh, what the, um, uh, what would the model suggest? And in this case, it, it would say, you should pick this data point over here with those settings. And, uh, and then you can, uh, we can acquire it by pressing acquire. And then it will say, okay, now that I also have that data point, you should, uh, you should go for this one. Then we can acquire that. And the return means undo the, uh, the acquire ring. Um, Acquire, acquire, acquire. You can see you can build up a model, and then you can you can see see the the true energy landscape. You can just we we couldn't do that before, but now we have it uh, coded here. Uh, that is what we are really searching for. And you can see here. So far, we have found a bit of it, but not all. And uh, and we can keep going, and hopefully it works on your screens. So so uh, so try this. And play around with uh, with what descriptor you are using, and then I'll I'll give you some five minutes or something because that it's quite rich. This now you can see based on which descriptor you use, how well is your uh, is this lower confidence bound guiding you towards the the uh, uh, a data point that would be. Uh, uh, um, close to the global minimum. I can, I guess there's a question there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is shame. It is the shame. It is the shame. Yeah. 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 So, 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 so the, uh, the, the green line in the middle of the shame. You, you sort of, one of the out of the math is the mean value of all models that you would share based on your data. Just, uh, I mean, that's the shaded region. The mean value of the shaded region is the green one. And the shaded region tells you that, that you actually don't know more. And given those, that, that, those no. data, they are unlikely mm -hmm. to have come out mm -hmm. of any model right. that would lie in the shaded region. Mm -hmm. Um, estimate this shaded region by repeatedly sampling, but I can calculate it. I can calculate it with a closed expression right. that I yeah. gave yes. and that I never motivated. I just put it out there right. and exactly. said that is a closed exactly. expression. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so yeah. why would you even consider the yeah. like yeah. plus uh, that um, also so that we said that we were um, choosing areas in large uncertainty yeah. and we think the lower bound 
So remember when I had these uh, circular diagrams, uh, so for the Gopi algorithm, at some point I would say I have picked a parent, then I, I turn it in say 10, 100 different ways. In each of those 100 different ways, yeah, and then, then so so the relics. No, so so um, if I have it, for example, the golden the yellow points on a small purple. Yeah. Pass down to the bottom of the green shaded area. Okay. And then that's a new structure that sort of optimizes energy because we are, we are going, we are, we are almost following the, the, the green line. Mm -hmm. It's optimizing energy yeah. and uncertainty. Would you do these relaxations with your with the machine right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Every, that's the whole point. I mean, okay. Ever since the very beginning, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 with the machine learning model because that gives me this factor one. Yeah. 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 If I want to do it with DFT, then all the time it is, is it, it should go with yeah. the yeah. machine learning yeah. yeah. region, yeah. Yeah. but the yeah. area is just this. Yeah. This we um, have a formula for the expression where. Energy yeah. minus kappa. The, uh, the green line, that's the energy of any structure. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. huh? And then the shaded region, mm -hmm. so the bottom of the shaded region, yeah. that's the green line minus, I mean, that's, just the, that's minus kappa times yes, sigma. Yes, exactly. yeah. That's the bottom of the. Yeah. And this, you relax. The, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the landscape I use for. Okay, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I have one more question. Yeah, okay, uh, the last question is why would you even consider doing a relaxation for the other one that is so far? That's that's what this video tells you because you can see here uh, over there to the left um, right. at about 0.25. Yes, I have a very low energy in the green dotted uh, green uh, dashed line. Mm -hmm. That's the true energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, so there is a good structure over there. The model uh, right now predicts a very high energy, mm -hmm. and uh, but also a high uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So so uh, so if I were to relax right now mm -hmm. over oh, there, I would get to there at about 0.25. I would get a data point this down on the green curve, right? And then that would tremendously modify my my model. So that's why I want to do it. I want to. I, I want to sort of be serious about uncertainty. Mm -hmm. yeah. In this case, it will not happen because kappa is too small. Okay. Let me go down and do it. So, so I, I mean, the thing is, okay, I think I think we can resume, given also the question I, I had. So so I'm getting the question, why, why are you doing this relaxation on the uh, acquisition function? So, so that's the bottom of this shaded region. Why is it you're doing that? And you can see here, um, there, there's a good minimum line over here that I will not predict based on the blue line, which is the model. And uh, I'm also not predicting it based on the on the bottom of this shaded region. But if I crank up, I hope the um, the kappa will not be able to. Um, I don't get why I'm not allowed to. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Apparently, it, it does. I, I'm not familiar with the region. So, so apparently, it does not increase the, uh, I mean, the region stays two sigma, apparently. But now I've I've ended so so if I end up two up here, the the blue curve no actually it's it's probably one sigma then I don't know what it is it's you can see the region of uncertainty is here 
And then with two sigma, I get down on, on this blue curve. That's the acquisition function over there. Might, might be there's a small mistake here. If I increase the kappa, then, then I, I also lower the acquisition function over here. And at some point it will say, okay, I should, I, I actually already did so. I should go away from this region where I know a lot and into a region where I don't know a lot, even though the model predicts a high energy because the uncertainty drives me to this point anyhow. And, and, um, and when I search for new data or new structures in, in, in the entire configuration space for which to um, evaluate or, or, or I search for new structures that could sort of enter the competition to become the one that is evaluated with the expensive energy expression, the DFT energy. Uh, when I do that, um, I, I, I relax on this landscape. So even if I sort of started it out here, it will then relax down to this point. And that is actually where uh, there's some bonus to be uh, gotten. So, so let me turn it down to three again, and then you can see uh, are that's still enough. Let me turn it to two. I think at some point, yeah, at some point it says you should acquire a data point over here with a sigma, uh, with a kappa of two, uh, none of these other regions can compete with, with this region, even though we know nothing over there. But that's because the model has become too uh, uh, certain that the energy is high at those places, even in the absence of data. And then hopefully what you tried while I, I've been talking was to take one of the other descriptors because with, with the other descriptors, this is less of a problem. There, it, uh, we will be driven towards those regions and make uh, better predictions. But you can see now the, we are biased strongly towards regions of low energy and we will never get a resolution uh, in regions of high energy because that's now our acquisition function. The function that determines where to go next is, is not willing to, uh, attempt to get a data point in a region where we both have a high energy uh, uh, or where we have a high energy despite we also have a higher uncertainty. Then not until we, we crank this up, now I put in 10 just to make a ridiculous prediction. If, if I make a, a very high kappa, then this high energy region with some uncertainty can become the prefer, preferred place to, to get the next data point. So what you have seen here is an active uh, learning strategy. And, um, and, and uh, I promised, but I really, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I mean, the only thing missing in the notebook now is to write an acquisition function that only returns the uncertainty. Well, it's actually a return minus the uncertainty because we are going towards low energies, uh, low, uh, yeah, we're going towards regions that are low, so, so, uh, so it's like energy minus kappa sigma, but where uh, kappa is one and where energy is neglected. So then we only have minus sigma. So let me write minus sigma here and run that. And then Masbeta has done it so that you can add uh, uh, stuff to your widget. So now we have it available here as an acquisition function See, now we have this uncertainty that we just programmed on this, on, in the cells above, it's, it's beyond my understanding this. So, uh, so now, okay, let, let me shift back. So lower confidence bound, that's the thing about, and, and, and let's say seek a kappa equals one with that. Uh, that's about saying we have the, um, the prediction, we subtract one times the uncertainty. And then it says you should go here and let, let us take another coordinate. Um, actually, yeah, that's not a good one. We, I need, I'm looking for one where there's a difference in where I would go depending on, um, depending on the, whether or not the energy is included. Yeah, so let's take this one. So here it says, you have a low energy over here, according to the prediction, and you have a decently high uncertainty. So that's where we would go. But if we use 
just plain uncertainty and not energy minus uncertainty. If you just use minus uncertainty, we take the energy out of it, then, okay, <laughs> then we are still there that it's, um, uh, I, I, I eyeballed it. I thought the uncertainty was larger over here, but, but let's acquire that data point then to get rid of it. So now we have acquired it. And now we can see that, that it, it now prefers this region here where the uncertainty is large, even though the, uh, uh, the energy is predicted to be high. Whereas if we flip back to the lower confidence bound, the energy minus Kappa Sigma, then we will still be over here. Even though we just got a data point over here, it still says, ah, I really think that it could be, it could be a low energy here. And now, now the uncertainty is not so big as a minute ago because we got this data point. So with this, with, the, with energy minus Kappa Sigma, we would take the next data point over here with plain uncertainty, we would take the next data point here in the middle. Yeah. And uh, with that, I'll go back to the presentation and say that uh, uh, the uh, lower confidence bound, the energy minus Kappa Sigma is not the only acquisition function you can think of. You can also think of uh, the expected improvement, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, saying that if I take a data point up here, then there will be this distribution on the uh, uh, expectation value. And, um, and you can take the, uh, uh, you can evaluate what would the improvement be? So that would be how much lower is it than some other known data point? What would the improvement be times the likelihood of, uh, of getting such a, a low observation over here. And you could use that as your expected improvement. Um, alternatively, you could also just say, what is the probability that I get an improvement? That's just the integral of this distribution divided by the uh, norm of the, of the distribution. So, so uh, and Mas Peter has implemented those further down in the notebook. And uh, there's, there you will be maximizing your acquisition function rather than minimizing it, uh, because now you want the highest energy gain by this new data point, or you want the highest likelihood that it's better than what you have beforehand. Uh, I will not demonstrate that, but it's it's there for you to use, and it uh, takes no, uh, I mean, there's no extra code that you need to input. So, so with that, I'll consider uh, this first part done, and I have left myself with uh, 15 minutes, which is <laughs> perfectly okay. Um, to say, could we do better than this? I mean, we have spent now together three hours trying to uh, build machine learning potentials based on DFT data so that we can do more of the brute forcing, trying to find the best structures by uh, covering a whole, a large number of structures. Like, like I demonstrated, we could do 180,000 structures unlike the Georgia Tech group who could only do 3,600 structures. I don't know if third, no, they could do, yeah, yeah, counting also the, the every step on the relaxation pass. So, so that was what the first part was about. I'm asking the question now, could we ask the machine to give us the result right away without those considerations? I mean, can we have a machine that basically learns chemistry and then draws uh, the solution. I mean, rather than saying, eat all this data, okay, I should point with this point. Rather than saying, eat all this data and predict energies for, the, for it. Could we say, eat this uh, piece of space, take that as an input, and then also the requirement to place 13 platinum atoms in the most clever way. Could we ask it to do that? And then it would draw this solution immediately. That's my dream. That's what I'll spend the, <laughs> the, the next 15 minutes telling you how far I've come and the next 15 years uh, uh, doing it. So, uh, and, uh, and the inspiration comes from uh, uh, Alpha, no, uh, Google DeepMind, who, who made this uh, machinery, the Alpha Go and the Alpha Zero, where they, 
they basically uh, feed the uh, neural network with a, an image of a board game, the, the board game Go, and then the, um, uh, the machinery should make two predictions. It should predict what is the likelihood that you're going to win based on this current situation on the board, and it should make the prediction where would be the, uh, the best place to put a stone, uh, they're calling go, uh, um, uh, when it's your turn, in order to improve your chances of winning. So, so that's how they first implemented it. And then later on, they, they changed the, the outline. But it's basically, I mean, this, this, these are two good concepts. I mean, being able to judge, is this good or bad? And then uh, given that, what would be the better thing to do? What, what, what should guide my action here? And uh, if you haven't seen it, then go to YouTube and search for the, uh, the movie uh, uh, on, uh, on this AlphaGo. It's a two-hour movie. I've seen it at least three times, and uh, it's so uh, it's so amazing. It's uh, better than action movies. Go uh, see it. Go watch it. So, what does that look like when it's atoms and molecules and clusters and surfaces and so on, and not uh, a board game? Well, then it looks like this: you you have a space where some atoms are already placed. You represent it in some way. And in the beginning, we actually represented it in this way where we condense the atoms into dots and we later uh, uh, deviate from that and actually keep them as uh, bulky uh, uh, objects. Then you have a neural network and uh, it uses what is called a convolution uh, uh, approach. Where uh, the thing is, uh, you, I mean, a neural network, and I've not talked about it at all, but it's, it's, a, it's this thing about uh, feeding a representation of uh, your structure or your whatever into um, the input side. And then every, um, every pixel inside here does a calculation and, uh, and passes on uh, the result of that calculation to the next cell and so on. And when you do convolutions, it's, uh, it's done in a way where you feed it into the same uh, computational cell that, that sort of moves over your image. And that, and that means that you're sort of doing the same thing to all pixels. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's because, I mean, you want, you want to sort of have the network generalized. So if atoms are bonding in some way in one corner of your system, then it would be the same energy that should come out of that if they were bonding in the same way in some other corner, or it should be the same, if not energy, but then the same, you should sort of experience the same, see the same, understand the same based on that input, irrespective of where it is on, uh, in space. So it's like the translational invariance we had in the descriptor that you can you can enforce by by choosing a neural network that is convolutional. And uh, and then uh, on the output side you get uh, this uh, raster plot where uh, the most intense colors are wherever the machinery says here is uh, the best place to put an atom if you want to win the game, or if you want to place another couple of atoms later on and end up with a very stable structure. It's, it's, not, it's not pointing out where is the, where can you place an atom so that that atom bonds most strongly. It's pointing out where to strategically, where to place the next atom so that you end up with the best structure. So that's very li like uh, the uh, the board game, and then where you also you you cannot be short sighted. You cannot just say, "Ah, if I put a stone here, I gain one stone from him and win." No, you will probably uh, lose some big part of the board uh, because you didn't respond to an attack that was made over there or whatever. It's the same thing here. It it has to be a, a strategic move. And how did the uh, AlphaGo, uh, how did that, I mean, when they trained it there, how did it learn that? 
Well, it played against itself. And we will just do the same thing. We'll just tell the machinery to, um, to, to keep uh, going and try and see if it can build a better structure than it has, has done so far. That's, that's the equivalent of play, playing against itself. And, uh, and it works this way that, uh, that this machinery are condensed into this uh, robot and then the robot puts an atom on the template. It puts another atom and it keeps putting atoms until it has built the entire structure according to, according to this current prescription that it, uh, that it gives by itself. And now it has a structure and it can do the DFT calculation now we, we forget about machine learning uh, potentials. We just do the expensive one. Uh, it, do, it does the DFT calculation and it converts that into a reward. Uh, and basically a reward is high if it's a structure which is be better than anything it built before. And it's low if it's worse than anything it built before. And then it plays against itself. And you can see I've put in some stuff here, epsilon greedy. It means that it, greedy would have been if it always places the atom where it predicts would be best. But if it does that, it gets stuck immediately because then it just builds one structure and keeps building that. It has to sort of try something new every now and then, just like the exploitation we had with the last capas in the machine learning uh, data acquisition. And, and that's it. That's it. It took uh, two years for six people to code. <laughs> uh, here's one thing. I, I argued that I had translational symmetry. We have a means of doing rotational symmetry. And here's another thing. Uh, it can be done for more than one species by having more input layers, just like, just like when you do image recognition and stuff, you can input more colors in your image. Uh, but here's the result. And uh, this is a, 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 an agent that has start, been started out from scratch. It knows nothing. I mean, I've given it space. That's the template uh, with, with one atom. And it says to me, uh, put the atoms at the dark uh, pixels. Uh, and they are completely ridiculous, those places. But let me, I think this one is the darkest uh, or, or perhaps one over there. But let's try. Yeah, I was the first one. So it places an atom there, and now this one is the darkest. Then it places one there and so on. So it does whatever it codes for itself at this point in time. And this point in time is the first, the very first episode. The neural network is just random numbers so far. And this is the structure we get, and it has an average energy of 10 EV per atom, which is a ridiculous high number. And it's a ridiculous structure, but nonetheless, after 200 episodes, and I kid you not, it's, it, it's the only thing, this loop, after 200 episodes, this agent has taught itself that when it sees an atom like that, it should place the next atom in a perimeter around it somewhere. And when it has done that, it should place it at the end of the dimer that has formed. And when it has done that, it should place it at the end of the trimer and so on. So it has taught itself to build linear structures. That is its current way of winning the game against itself in building the most stable structure. And then it runs out of space. I'm forcing it to place 24 or, or 23 carbon atoms in, uh, in addition to the one that it starts out with. It runs out of space, but it can see there's some room for atoms here uh, and still uh, getting a decent uh, value for the energy per atom. Now we're down to one EV higher than the best possible structure that, that it doesn't know anything about. There's no human interfering here. It's just running. The humans, they work for those two years <laughs> already. Um, okay, a thousand episodes. Now the agent has, has taught itself that, well, don't place the first atom so close as you did a minute ago. That was good if you were to build those linear structures, but now we're doing something better. We are placing it, uh, the, the second atom slightly further away, and we are not placing the third atom at the end of the dimer. We are placing it at an angle, and uh, we keep uh, following this principle of, of uh, uh, making 120 degree angles, and then it fills space with graphene. Isn't it amazing? You see, that, that's why I want to spend 15 years, <laughs> 15 minutes, and 15 years on this. Uh, so. 
it to me is just breathtaking. And you can take it further, uh, though. I mean, we have. I've, I mean, this was back in 2018, 19 that we had our very first result with this. Um, I, I have to be honest with you. We have not solved real problems yet, but I have this one in mind, which is. Um, uh, uh, a surface reconstruction observed on palladium 100, where you put in oxygen and then uh, the surface reconstructs. It goes through a number of uh, periodic cells uh, written here and ends up with a root five by root five structure. And uh, and if you do a Monte Carlo search with, with the method I, I had in the first part of the presentation, it looks like this, and it easily finds that root five by root five structure. That's the one we have here. But it doesn't find the. Um, where, where, um, did I even... It doesn't find the uh, this structure down here, the five by five. There's a there's apparently a structure where the periodicity you can see it's it's hard to see that the periodicity is root five by root five in that structure here. But but there's one where you have uh, four or five times as many must be five times as many atoms in the cell which it missed. And we have tried to see if, if uh, this agent can help us find that. So, so uh, it, it, it's a it's a very hard it's very hard to try and solve that from scratch. If you if you ask the agent to solve the, for the entire five by five system, it, uh, it first of all the DFT calculations are very costly, and um, and it's just a very complicated system. So so we have uh, trained the agents on smaller systems. And here's a small system, a three by three system, uh, where some of the palladium atoms are missing and I've not even put in any oxygens yet. And, uh, and you can see here the agent that has been pre-trained on this, in this way where it competed against itself, it, had, it has, has learned a lot. You can, you can see what I'm plotting here is, where should you put the atoms if uh, the palladium was put in any of these positions. And you can see there's a consequence. If you, if you put the palladium here in the middle where the oxygen ought to be, then the oxygens uh, have to go new places. Um, oops. So, uh, and also it becomes less confident that, that, that the best structure can be built by placing, this used to be a, a dark raster uh, color it becomes less confident that it makes sense to put an oxygen here because now it probably makes more sense to put a palladium uh, somewhere in between or whatever. That's, that's what it, uh, it, it, it has taught itself on this smaller system. And, um, and then you can take it, uh, I can, you can leave this in one place and then you can ask the same question, what if I move oxygen around? You can see it has consequences. Wherever it sees an atom means that placing the next atoms will not be uh, as trivial uh, because now it sort of meets a situation where this atom has already been placed. It's, it's like the game, the goal game. So if your opponent does something and now your whole conception of what you can do uh, changes. That, that is what we see that the agent, I mean, it has that understanding of the, the, the board of atoms uh, as a consequence of where the atoms are. And, uh, and now we can apply it to a big system. And uh, it's not yet the five, it, it is the five by five setup, but I have placed some of the atoms already. And I'm only asking the agent to place uh, the remaining atoms. But it's, it's still quite a big problem. I believe if I gave it to you and said, please place eight oxygen atoms and 12 palladium atoms or whatever it is we are placing here in a minute, you would still have to sort of play around a little bit with, with the atoms and, and uh, make this puzzle uh, uh, fit. But, uh, but it uses the knowledge it had from the small system and the knowledge it has gained by playing against itself on this template. And, and now we place atoms, you can see it has found out that this is where oxygen goes first. Then you go, uh, palladium goes there oxygen and so on. It, so it, it builds a structure and it looks random and it looks like it has, it has overfitted that it has sort of found this structure by accident and then just remembered all those positions. But that's not the case because you can present it 
with the um, uh, with the template once again, and then you can build deliberately in a different sequence, and then you force it to to consider situations that are not the ones that came out of its self-play. And you can see it actually always gets it right, that, that it has to, to make this pattern of oxygen and palladium. Some of the uh, 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 oxygens are placed in between four palladiums and some are placed in between three and two and so on. They are not all placed in the same way. So it's not that trivial and it has, it has that understanding, even though it tested itself on a different build sequence. So I see a little bit of artificial intelligence here, a little bit of chemical understanding. It, it, it can generalize. It doesn't just find a good solution for you and then that's it. Just like all we did in the last hour, hours, there, I was only occupied with finding the global minimum, and then I didn't care how I found it. I just, I just wanted to enhance my chances of finding it by following this acquisition function and all. Here, I want, to, I care about why do I find whatever I find, and and I, I postulate that in this case, I found a good solution um, because it, it it made sense out of the data. And uh, here's how far we have come with the clusters in 3D. It's the same mechanism. And, and the thing about scanning, that's just because it's impossible to show this raster plot in 3D otherwise. So you can see we scan through and see where is the next place you should place an atom in order to win the game, in order to build the most stable cluster. And this is the solution we find uh, for uh, eight platinum atoms on graphene. And uh, with that, I'm through. I'd like to thank the, uh, the group I had uh, helping me, and especially Ms. Peter and Nikolai. And uh, I'll just point out that uh, if, you, uh, if you are intrigued by this last thing I showed, there is this website, asla.au.dk, where the, um, the agents are available for some small chemical problems, uh, and, and you can you can play with it and see what our current uh, level is. And then, for God's sake, uh, apply for that uh, postdoc ship. <laughs> <laughs> you are intrigued by this. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Bjorn. Uh, we have maybe a couple of minutes if you do have questions now. Otherwise, I think Björk will also be here tomorrow morning. And uh, yeah, this one. Uh, would there be a large benefit to initialize this neural network with reasonable structures? Uh, would that uh, uh, improve the learning rate of the model? And have you tried something like that, or is it just you? You, you mean for the for the graphene case, for yeah. instance? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, definitely, if you trained it on a on a smaller cell where you could not fit perhaps graphene, um, but it could at least discover that the 120 degree angles are preferred. But is it uh, like unnecessary to? It's unnecessary for that small system, but that's exactly what I did for the um, for this oxide system here. Here I I I didn't give this big system to the agent immediately. I didn't I didn't. It wasn't competing against itself from scratch on this yeah. problem. It was given the smaller problem to compete against itself on. And then because these are convolutional networks, they can apply also to bigger systems. Yes, please. Oh. Yes, yeah. up there. Then. Sorry, maybe I didn't catch the point here, but uh, you of the oxygen and palladium uh, in a sequence or it is on the global probability of it, the, the, um, the, the the agent determines the sequence so so you here you you read out the um, this is the output from the neural network uh, and the uh, intensity of the raster um, uh, pixels signifies the magnitude of, uh, I mean, 
what is the expectation for the final reward it will get? I mean, how, what are the chances of winning? What is the, what are the chances of building a new, uh, equally good structure to what it has seen before, or a better structure? That is that is depicted by the intensity, and then the color depicts what type of atom should go there. So 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 here it's the oxygen which is the more intense. So it that would code for placing an oxygen next. But let, let me see if I can uh, yeah if I can force it. So here let me see here over here it's always always the let me go further back because there was a, there must have been a situation where. Yeah, so here they're all shallow. So right now it seems like oxygen is the next atom to place, but then here it's it's actually palladium, which is the next one to place. So so it depends on the input. And then there was this, I call it epsilon greedy. There was this chance of picking a, a, a pixel that is not the highest one, just to try something new. And that is actually very, important for this uh, method uh, because it needs to try something new, but not all the time, because if it does it all the time, it will just keep building crazy structures. So it should be, it should only be done every now and then. Um, <clears throat> regarding the um, last slide with this um, eight platinum atoms, uh, is this work that you have published? No. And it has been, it has been, um, uh, we have had it for three years or so, but, but it's not published because the ambition is uh, higher. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and about the other approach with this. And, and also because we published the first work and it has been cited 25 times over, over four years. So we are the only ones interested in this, apparently. <laughs> so, so there is no, there's no, it, it, there's this feeling of we better publish this before someone else does the same thing. I mean, we're the only group who can do this at the moment. So, uh, so I can keep uh, <laughs> postponing publishing. This is both good and bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, uh, Andre, last question. Yeah. In the Sophie and here also, how do you manage so it doesn't put atoms too close to each other to really with the here and Um, yeah, you, um, I, I, yeah, actually, there, there's a cutoff, uh, it, it, it's not allowed to put atoms closer than a certain distance, uh, in, in both codes. Um, I for a long time try to force my group to not have that uh, cut off um, because I think it's artificial. I think it's like putting domain knowledge into your uh, machine learned uh, potential or your machine learned agent here. And I dislike that, but it's just, as you point out, I mean, you don't want to get into the situation where the DFT crashes. So, uh, so it's a pragmatic solution that is to have a cutoff I would say for this for this setup, it's actually good for the agent to get the information that it's uh, at, it's not allowed to put atoms there. So what we do is we we allow it initially to put the atoms, and then we don't do the DFT calculation. We just return a, a low reward, which uh, which then tells the agent, ah, so that was not a good idea. It doesn't know that that's because the, the DFT calculation will crash. It just knows that it's because it got a bad reward. And then it will sort of stop doing it. That's way better than having a, 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 a sort of a, a man-made uh, trick. <laughs> yeah. So that's the compromise I've made with the group. <laughs> okay, good. So let's thank Jörg again. Thank you.